Thank you, Sammy. Okay, moving to our final round of paper speakers. Speaking third in proposition of the motion tonight is Dia Chakravarti. Dia is the Brexit editor of the Daily Telegraph and the former political director of the Taxpayers Alliance. A political activist, she was named in commentator Ian Dale's 100 Most Influential on the Right. <laughs> Dia, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It is an absolute honour to stand here and speak to this debating chamber and having the chance to listen to such amazing debates from, from people um, whose age I was a long time ago, mostly, and I did not even know how to put two words together. So it, it really is a massive privilege. It is an even greater privilege for me to speak in favour of the motion. And I remember once taking part um, in, in a balloon debate while at sixth form. I chose to put the case forward for Prometheus and felt certain that the man's record would speak for itself. He brought fire to mankind. What else needed to be said for this man? If he doesn't deserve to be in the balloon, then who does? I was wrong. I was the first to be voted out. Now, that might have something to do with my debating skills, but I think the verdict was that thank you for all that help, and we're very grateful and all that, but what use are you to be anyway, anymore? Off you jump. You've done everything that you could have done for us. And I learned a lesson that day. Dedicate yourself to the good of humanity. Destroy yourself in the process. The first chance they get, they will push you out of the balloon. But I refuse to be ungrateful. Without Margaret Thatcher, there's a good chance that I would not have been here. And so I feel I have an obligation to remind the House of the wisdom, wisdom and the foresight of her policies. Policies which were often condemned by her opposition, who did not share her foresight nor her conviction. The speaker there very eloquently uh, uh, talked about her conviction. The conviction to stay the course. The introduction of tuition fees for international students was one such policy. Almost universally, not now, thank you, almost universally condemned as catastrophic for the higher education sector, as well as being racist. Her critics were certain that no international student would ever set foot into the United Kingdom, recalls Professor Terence Keeley, who served as an advisor to Baroness Thatcher. Her critics had the satisfaction of being right for only a little while. After a temporary dip, the number of international students continued to grow. It provided the universities with an invaluable source of income, taking away their dependency um, on taxpayers' money, freeing up cash for other sectors, but also opening up the opportunity to study at a British university for many, many more foreign students than ever before. The university, no, in a minute, thanks. The University of Cambridge today hosts over 40% of its students from outside the UK, representing around 140 countries. Margaret Thatcher had the last laugh, and with her, with her laughed hundreds and thousands of students from all over the world, which is a funny outcome for an apparently racist policy. Statistics suggest, statistics suggest that many of them will be present here in this theatre. And I make an unabashed appeal for those votes. Do not be like my balloon traitors from years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, support a fellow international student in her quest to win some votes. Let us celebrate a politician without his unwavering faith in the benefits of opening up a closed market. There's a good chance neither you nor I would be here. That conviction to own a policy, that tenacity to hold her nerve and see a policy through, to have faith that it will deliver, was at the heart of her governing principles during her years in Downing Street. Those are also the qualities which are absolutely vital for any leader to adopt and display in order to not just get the job done, but to bring people with them. These are, alas, also the precise qualities which are completely absent in our political class today. No wonder Alex feels that Britain's lost faith in its, in its politicians. Unlike our current crop of politicians, Margaret Thatcher came into politics to govern, and govern she did. Jeremy Paxman, this university's own actually, um, noted in one of his books, Mrs Thatcher thought, rightly, he adds, that royal commissions were a substitute for de decisive government and none was established during her tenancy of Downing Street. Her successor, by the way, John Major, had no such reservations, setting up the first one for over a decade within six months of taking office. 
bureaucracy to Margaret Thatcher was a means of inaction, a justification for not doing anything. It is the computer's way of legitimising, saying no. It was therefore something of which she was suspicious, and royal commissions were an example of whole organisations being created which would achieve very little or even nothing after spending a huge amount of taxpayers' money and wasting a huge amount of everybody's time. But it would provide the government of the day, which is ultimately responsible for, for tackling whatever issue the Royal Commission would be set up to address, with a cover. A cover first to be seen to be doing something, and then to hide under when the problem remains uns unresolved. For weaker politicians, therefore, it's much easier to neither govern nor take responsibility for policy failures. And with some notable exceptions, as if to prove the rule, our senior politicians today are prone to hide behind their army of civil servants and quangos, and God knows they have set up enough of them to hide behind. Um, I think by one estimate, the House of Commons Research Papers estimate, there are between 760 to 957 autonomous public bodies, or quangos, the number depending on the definition used, receiving government funding of up to £80 billion and spending over £120 billion of taxpayers' money. I don't think anybody doubts that the civil service has a mind of its own. And of course, it'll be a challenge to implement policies without its support, and perhaps even impossible in the face of open defiance. Former MP Rory Stewart um, includes in his book a passage where he narrates a rather dangerous example um, of what can be reasonably described, I think, as the civil service's belligerence. A minister at the Department of International Development at the time, his repeated attempts to prevent jihadists in Syria from receiving British funding failed because of his civil servant's determination for that particular aid programme to go ahead. So how did Margaret Thatcher manage to get her civil servants on her side, at least to the extent that she was able to deliver her agenda? It all comes back to her conviction, tenacity and the willingness to own her policies according to those who worked closely with her. Once the civil servants, once the, once, once the civil servants believed that she herself believed in her agenda and she was prepared to back it against political and personal attacks, they knew neither she nor the plan she presented were going anywhere. In the case of our current leaders, the civil servants know that it's mostly political rhetoric coming out of our politicians, which can change any day. So why bother? I've got a woman's ability to stick to a job and get on with it when everyone else walks off and leaves it, said Margaret Thatcher in 1975. Being a woman to her was always more about getting things done, about delivering, rather than pontificating, notably a word which is derived from the Latin father, of course, a dedicated male role. At the 25th anniversary of the Institute of Economics Affairs, having just sat through a series of self-congratulatory speeches, men, Margaret Thatcher began her remarks with the following, I have just listened to seven speeches by men and all I can say is cocks may crow but hens lay the egg. At the time Margaret Thatcher was a student, not here of course but at a slightly better university, not far from here, she would not, that was churlish, sorry, a much better university not far from here, as an undergraduate she would not have been allowed to speak at a union debate either in this fine chamber or at her own university. That privilege would have been solely reserved for the Cox. But of course, as she herself proved, while it might take us time, we hens are very good at slowly but surely pecking our way into any chamber if we feel it is worth our while. At a memorial service for Margaret Thatcher in 2013, Professor Swinnerton Dyer, a former Vice-Chancellor of this university, paid tribute to what he called her instinct to spring clean, saying this country needed spring cleaning, not the least the university sector. I think we can all agree that this country is in dire need again of a spring clean. Ladies and gentlemen, the country is in need of another Margaret Thatcher. Please vote in favour of this motion.